and all these countries got three major superpowers by joining the European Union. Now listen to this very, very carefully, because here's where the heart of the UK's economic crisis lies. The first superpower that these countries enjoyed was the superpower of EU citizenship, which means all the citizens of the European Union could move and reside freely in any European Union country. Secondly, in the European Union, goods, services and capital could move across national borders without any barriers. So, a furniture businessman in Greece could sell his furniture in the UK and there was no extra tax and no trade regulation. And lastly, for the small countries, the European Union gave an unfair advantage of trade negotiation. For example, imagine if a small country like Hungary and a giant like India sit at the negotiation table. Now you tell me, who will have an upper hand in this negotiation? India has a population of 1.4 billion, while Hungary's population is only 10 million. So if we sit down for a bilateral trade agreement, we could tell Hungary that we will give your automobile industry access to a population of 1.4 billion if you reduce your import taxes by 25%. But Hungary will have to decrease the import duty on Indian automobiles by 50%. Why? Because we are a bigger country and we can exploit a small country because we are giving them access to a much bigger market. But you know what, guys? Here's where the European Union came in and they said, instead of an individual country bargaining with India, the entire European Union will sit down with India to negotiate. So now the European Union is sitting down as a single entity with a population of 447 million people. And this makes them so, so powerful that while India has a population of 1.4 billion people and a per capita income of $2,700, the EU as an entity comes with a population of 450 million people and a per capita income of $52,000. So now do you realize, when the European Union as a giant entity sits at the negotiation table with India, the EU has a much better bargaining power against India, even though India has a population of 1.4 billion? So this is such a fantastic arrangement, isn't it? Every country gets better negotiation power, better citizen freedom, better relationship with European powers, and most importantly, you get market access to a much wider population as compared to your own country. Then the question is, why did the UK exit the European Union? Well, out of the many, many reasons, here are three of the most important reasons why the United Kingdom exited the European Union. The first reason was that the UK thought the European Union benefited more from the UK than the UK benefited from the European Union. For example, between 2012 to 2016, the average volume of fish caught by the European Union fishermen in British waters was 760,000 tons per year, whereas the British fishermen caught only 90,000 tons of fish in the EU waters, which was eight times less than the European Union. Similarly, in 2013, the UK's gross contribution to the European Union budget was around 17 billion euros, whereas they received back only 6.31 billion euros. Now, if you look at the net contribution of the UK, it turns out to be 10.76 billion euros, right? So if you see, there was a huge disparity in budget contributions among the European Union states. So this is the reason why the Brits felt like they were being robbed by the European Union. How ironical, isn't it? For a change, the Brits felt like they were being robbed, if you know what I mean. That is hilarious. The second thing that bothered them was immigration. So while the European Union expanded, several countries like Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary got in. And because citizens could move across borders, many people started coming from less developed countries into the United Kingdom. The foreign population almost doubled from 5.3 million in 2004 to over 9.5 million people in 2021, which was about 12% of the entire population of the UK. So the Brits felt worried about foreigners entering their land. Again, how ironical, isn't it? The Brits were worried about foreigners coming into their country. This drastically increased strain on public services and housing, lowered wages of workers because of oversupply of labor, and eventually decreased job opportunities for their own citizens. This was the third problem that the UK had. 
And lastly, the United Kingdom felt that they could easily negotiate better deals with countries like India rather than the European Union doing it for them. These are the reasons why they decided to conduct a referendum to opt out of the European Union. So after the referendum of 52 to 48, finally Brexit happened on the 23rd of June, 2016. But, 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 as it turns out, as of now, things are not going well for the UK at all. And this is what the situation in the UK looks like. The picture across England is not much better. Food prices soared 13.6% in the last 12 months, and record housing costs are piling pressure on UK households. So the question over here is, what on earth went wrong with Brexit, and why is the UK in such a terrible situation? Well, the first major hit that the country faced was trade. If you look at the stats, you will realize that the European Union was one of the UK's largest trading partners. As of 2022, while UK exports to the EU accounted for 42% of all their exports, UK imports from the European Union were 48% of all UK imports. So you can imagine how much the UK depended on the European Union for trade. But after Brexit, the UK was no longer a part of the customs union, which allowed the flow of goods and services among the EU countries without any import duty or customs duty. So after Brexit, UK goods got taxed while moving to every country in the European Union. So to solve this problem, the UK thought they could simply sign something called the Free Trade Agreement. For those who don't know, FTA or Free Trade Agreement is when two or more countries agree to trade with each other with no taxes or very less taxes. So the UK thought they could sign the Free Trade Agreement with the European Union countries and they could easily trade with each other without immigrants, without contribution to the EU fund, and without allowing other European countries to exploit the UK. But you know what, guys? Here's where the UK economy faced a big, big problem. And this is a problem that even India is facing in 2024. So the question is, what is this problem? Ladies and gentlemen, this problem is that the UK and India both are not manufacturing-driven economies. We are service-driven export economies. So we don't make most of our money by exporting products, but by exporting our services. While the UK exports financial services, India exports IT services. So the question over here is, why is a service-driven economy so, so dangerous? And why is manufacturing better for India and the UK right now? Well, there are three simple reasons. Number one, manufacturing industries can provide way more employment as compared to service industries. And this is for both skilled as well as unskilled people. For example, while the IT industry constitutes 7.5% of our GDP, the textile industry barely accounts for 2.3% of our GDP. But if you look at the employment that they provide, the numbers are staggering. On the outside, if I asked you which sector would recruit more people, what would you say? Of course, the IT industry employs more people, right? Because their contribution is almost three times as much as the textile sector. But you know what, guys? While the IT services industry of India employs 5.43 million people, our textile industry employs 45 million people. And while the IT industry mostly recruits only skilled people, the textile industry employs millions of unskilled people along with the skilled people. So the manufacturing sector provides way more employment opportunities as compared to the service sector. Secondly, while the service sector is prone to more economic shocks, the manufacturing sector is relatively shockproof. For example, during the 2008 recession, while the financial services industry and the marketing services took a massive hit, Companies like Nestle, Procter & Gamble and Unilever were not as badly affected because while the people could cut down their spending on financial and marketing services, they could not cut down on essentials like razors, detergents and baby foods. And lastly, while manufacturing is easily scalable to increase exports, scaling a service company is very, very difficult. For example, if I have to increase the production of iPhones from 10,000 to 20,000 units, I can recruit, train and deploy people within a few weeks. And on top of that, all I have to do is get new machines and run at higher capacity. But if I have to go from 20 to 30 clients in my financial services business, it is very, very difficult. 
And by the way, guys, unless you're an entrepreneur, you can't understand the pain of what I'm saying. So if you can't understand this context of the pain of expansion, just talk to any service industry business owner and they will tell you everything. So long story short, the manufacturing sector has three major advantages over the service sector and these advantages revolve around employment, scale and resistance to economic shocks. But now, if you look at the UK's economy, 81% of the UK's GDP is dependent only on services. And if you see their production, it has been stagnant for over a decade. And this is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, two things happened. When the service industry had to comply with 27 different countries for legal and financial services after Brexit, the service industry of the UK got disrupted. On top of that, they saw two major crises with COVID and the Russia-Ukraine war. It's been revealed COVID-19 has dealt the UK's economy its biggest blow in more than 300 years. The Office for National Statistics has revealed the pandemic led to a 9.9% drop in the country's GDP over 2020. The actions we have taken to sanction Putin's regime are not cost-free for us at home. The invasion of Ukraine presents a risk to our recovery, as it does to countries around the world. We should be in no doubt behind Putin's invasion is a dangerous calculation. So as we all know, Two economic shocks resulted in yet another disruption in both the service as well as the manufacturing sector. This is the second reason why the UK is suffering, which is over-dependence on the service industry. And lastly, now because of Brexit, the UK is also witnessing a labour crisis. Long story short, as of 2021, 200,000 EU citizens have left the UK after Brexit. In addition to that, the UK has a shortage of more than 100,000 truck drivers. And what's even worse is that there is also a shortage of 30,000 nurses in hospitals. And in all, as of 2024, there are 89,000 vacancies in the UK, because of which sectors like hospitality and transport are struggling. So now the UK is finding it extremely difficult, even while the global economy is growing. And to make matters worse, the pound sterling is depreciating, which is further causing inflation and making people poor. So all of this put together, the UK has now entered into a vicious cycle where the government is not spending on health and welfare for people. People are not able to work because of long-term illness. These people are neither earning nor spending. So again, the economy is not growing at all. As a result, neither the government nor the businesses have money to expand or earn. This is nothing but the cause and effect relationship between government spending, public health, workforce participation and economic growth. This is the story of the European Union, Brexit and its impact on the UK economy. And this entire story teaches us three very, very important lessons for the Indian economy. Lesson number one, never consult stupid people for an important decision. In this case, the decision of Brexit was not made by the economists of the country, but by the people of the UK, who obviously did not know anything about running the economy. So if you ask an unemployed worker if he should ban foreign workers or not, he will. So why did the UK decide to leave the European Union? Well, it's a question with many layers. First, there was a growing sentiment among many Brits that EU membership was compromising the UK's sovereignty. They felt that too many decisions were being made in Brussels rather than in London. Additionally, concerns over immigration played a significant role. Many believed that leaving the EU would give the UK better control over its borders. And of course, there were economic arguments on both sides. Some thought that the UK would be better off negotiating its own trade deals, while others feared the economic repercussions of leaving the single market. Ultimately, these factors and more culminated in the referendum of 2016, where 52% of voters chose to leave. The aftermath of Brexit has been complex and multifaceted. Economically, the UK has faced both challenges and opportunities. There have been disruptions in trade and supply chains, but also new trade agreements with countries outside the EU. Politically, Brexit has reshaped the landscape leading to debates over national identity and the future of the UK's union. Socially, it has sparked discussions about immigration, multiculturalism 
and what it means to be British in the 21st century. The long-term effects of Brexit are still unfolding, and only time will tell how this historic decision will shape the future of the UK and its relationship with the world. You see, service-driven economies face unique challenges. Unlike manufacturing, services are often harder to scale and automate. This can lead to slower productivity growth. Additionally, service industries can be more vulnerable to economic fluctuations, affecting job stability and wages. Now let's take a closer look at the UK's labour crisis. The UK has been grappling with a shortage of skilled workers, especially in sectors like healthcare and construction. Brexit has exacerbated this issue by reducing the influx of foreign labour, leading to significant gaps in the workforce. As a result, businesses are struggling to fill positions, impacting overall economic growth. So, what can India learn from these challenges? For one, diversifying the economy is crucial. Relying too heavily on services can make an economy vulnerable. India should also focus on upskilling its workforce to meet the demands of various industries. By investing in education and vocational training, India can better prepare its labor force for the future. In conclusion, while service-driven economies offer many advantages, they also come with their own set of challenges. By understanding these issues and learning from the experiences of other countries, India can chart a more resilient and inclusive economic path. Thank you for joining us on this insightful journey.